Um, so there's my title. There's still time to run. <laughs> in fact, I said that to someone as they were walking in. Ah, oh, so fire and brimstone tonight. I might turn around, they said. Well, you can. Uh, because, you know, I mean, some aspects of Jesus' life are really fascinating and, and uplifting. Uh, even for people who aren't sure what to make of the Christian faith, they might look at a topic like teacher that we looked at a couple of weeks ago and think, yeah, there's, there's value there, especially the way Jesus taught so much against the religious leaders. So we like that one especially. Uh, he promised a kingdom of love. It's great. Uh, even Jesus' healer that we looked at last week uh, is, in a sense, uplifting, even if you're someone who can't quite bring yourself to believe the evidence that Jesus healed someone, evidence we looked at last week, which is pretty good. But even if you can't bring yourself to believe it, you can see that there's something uplifting about the idea that Jesus healed people as a kind of preview or trailer of human flourishing in the kingdom of God. But, judge, this is not uplifting. This is somewhat depressing, anxiety-inducing. And it's a topic that Christians have misused to abuse other people. And I imagine that there will be some here tonight who have been on the receiving end of the abuse of this idea that, that the God is judge. And the experience is so profound and off-putting that I can imagine it's going to be difficult for you tonight not to project that experience onto all the things I'm going to say. I don't have a way out for you. I, I know it can be a problem. Um, I remember in my very first week as an assistant pastor in this little church in Sydney. Very first week, I got a phone call asking me to do a pastoral visit with this woman, Judy. Judy was a local resident who was dying, not a churchgoer, but she had a, a next door neighbor who was a devout Christian, and uh, this neighbor wanted to set up a kind of spiritual blind date with the new assistant pastor. And so, uh, this is 25 years ago almost, I go over to Judy's house and I was very coy, I didn't really know what to say, I didn't know what her issue was, but I sat down and I just asked her, you know, why were you open to this, this pastoral meeting, this spiritual blind date? And she said, look, I know I'm dying, and I walked out of church 40 years ago, never been back. What happened? She said, well, there was this preacher, quite a well-known preacher, who preached all about judgment in a sermon. And for the whole message, he had a smile on his face. And I thought that was disgusting. I walked out of church that day, and I've never been back. A preacher had turned her off the Christian faith. And in her dying months, she just wanted to know, is there a version of the Christian faith that might make sense of this theme of judgment and of lots of other themes? I had the privilege of meeting with her many times before her death. But that's what I want to do tonight, try and make some sense of a very difficult uh, but somewhat unavoidable topic for anyone who opens a gospel, one of those biographies of Jesus, you're going to come across this theme. So we might as well just face it and see what happens. The first thing I think has to be said is this. How we feel about the topic of divine judgment will in large part depend on what side of the justice equation we think we are on. 
So just use your imagination. Think of Tanja, a Roma girl, trafficked from the Czech Republic to a brothel in Germany, 15 years of age. She was brutalized into compliance. She now services 10 men a day. And then she has to pose in front of a camera for the internet. At the end of a brutal day, she collapses into bed and sort of half-heartedly throws up the prayers she vaguely remembers her grandmother taught her. Not sure if there's anyone on the other end of the line. What do you think she thinks of divine judgment against wickedness? I bet she's thinking, how long, O oh Lord? But think of it from the other perspective. Think of the madam in the German brothel who has the audacity to think that Tanja has it a little better in the brothel. Three meals a day, better than being a traveling Roma girl. Think of the men that visit her regularly and somehow imagine they have a bond with her because she's been taught to smile. Or think of the teenager in Chicagoland who views her images online and thinks she must like it. I bet those people think very differently about the judgment of God. They would resent the idea of being caught out, of being under judgment. What I'm saying is how we feel about judgment will depend in large part on what we think we are on the line between injustice and justice. Can you hold that thought in suspended animation? I'm going to come back to it. But what I want to do is look at what the Bible has to say about judgment, specifically what Jesus had to say about judgment. But I want to set that in context, if you don't mind, which is kind of my historical instinct, uh, by just traveling back to the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, centuries before Christ, promised a Messiah who would come and judge the world. Now, there are many passages we could turn to, but I want to quote this famous one, um, a theme that we can find in many places, but I think this captures it well. Centuries before Christ, we read, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Jesse was the family name of King David. And this is a promise of a descendant of King David, a Messiah. But listen to the job description. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now it's clear from this passage um, and many others that judgment is about righting the wrongs of history. It's about bringing justice into the world, isn't it? It's clear from this passage that God is not like the angry, strict schoolmaster, you know, who's looking for naughty children to punish today. God is more like the passionate justice commissioner who feels called to bring justice into the world. That's how to think of judgment. God intends to bring justice for Tanja. And notice, will you, who it is that will bring the judgment, according to this Old Testament passage. It's this descendant of King David. It's the Messiah. He will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike down the wicked and so on. Now, this is a theme that is picked up in the New Testament, the writings that emerge around the time of Jesus and shortly after. 
In the New Testament, it's clear, if Jesus is the Messiah, then he is also judge. That's just the tradition. Um, All of the apostles, the eyewitnesses of Jesus, agreed on this point. I won't labor the point too much, except to say that in the New Testament, the apostle Paul speaks of Jesus as the one through whom the judgment takes place in Romans chapter 2. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. The apostle Peter said the same thing in Acts chapter 10. Uh, Jesus was seen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. I I love this passage in particular because Peter is balancing the theme of judgment with the theme of forgiveness. You want to hold those things together and we're going to do that uh, by the end of uh, tonight's talk for sure. But, But notice especially that Peter says we didn't make this up. Jesus commanded us to say to people, he is the judge of the living and the dead. Um, It's important to realize the church didn't invent this topic. I know the church has misused this topic, has wielded the coming judgment as a way of controlling people. I admit that has happened. It's terrible. And if you've received that, I reckon every genuine Christian here just would like to say we are sorry. But there is a truth here that Jesus himself taught and gave to his original eyewitnesses to tell the world. Here is a little known fact. The word hell is used 12 times in the New Testament. And 11 of them come from the lips of Jesus. For the nerds amongst you, you can take out your phones and just take that. And yeah, I love to see the nerds doing their job. Uh, And you can go and spend the rest of the night looking at that. Um, The Lord bless you and keep you as you do that. Uh, But this is fascinating. Hell, the original word is Gehenna, only occurs 12 times, but 11 of them from the lips of Jesus. The only other time, the 12th time, actually is in the letter written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. Top-tier secular scholars agree that this is authentic historical Jesus. Uh, Here is a a name you may have never heard of, Dale Allison from Princeton. He is at the very top of the study of New Testament in its historical context. And he is not the kind of scholar who is the least bit interested in proving Christianity, let me say. If you know anything about his writings, he's very happy to dismiss all sorts of things in the New Testament. But when he comes to this topic in a really important essay called The Problem of Gehenna, or The Problem of Hell, he makes this remark. He basically says, people like Jesus, they don't like hell, so what do they do? They invent a Jesus that didn't preach hell. Yeah, like we project our favorite themes onto Jesus. But he questions this. Given that so many people nowadays dislike hell, but still like Jesus, it is not surprising that some modern reconstructions of Jesus no longer depict him as a believer in future punishment. One could here be cynical and wonder to what extent the wish has cultivated the conclusion, a conclusion that certainly goes against the impression that the Gospels leave. And in this essay, he goes through a a rigorous historical analysis and concludes there is no historical Jesus that doesn't preach hell and judgment. I'm not going to take you through all 11 uh, sayings from the lips of Jesus on, on the topic of hell, but here is a taste. Here is Jesus in full flight in Matthew chapter 18. If your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life 
maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. They are Jesus' words. Um, The idea of the fire of hell or the eternal fire, I know, has become an awful cliche now. Um, I'm sure some people, if if that's the first time you've heard that from Jesus, you you might be thinking, someone must have put that in his lips. Like someone inserted that into the New Testament. That's not Jesus meek and mild. I'm afraid it is. But here's the interesting thing. Sometimes Jesus didn't speak of fire. He actually described eternal judgment as darkness. I think this is worth knowing. The darkness hasn't caught on in the public's imagination. You're being thrown into the darkness. You know, it's not that scary. Fire, scary. But here is a passage from Matthew chapter 8. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why am I pointing this out? Is it fire or is it darkness? As far as I understand, you can't have both at the same time. The fire rather undoes the darkness. And I, you know, it's, it's obvious that really what this underscores is that Jesus is using metaphors for judgment. It's neither fire nor darkness. These aren't concrete descriptions. They're metaphors. And I think this really comes home to us when we turn to the very word hell itself. Did you know that the term hell itself is a metaphor? Strictly speaking, if you're an English studies nerd, it's a metonym. But don't worry about that. Because the word hell, Gehenna, is actually the name of a valley south of Jerusalem called the Valley of Hinnon. Um, I went for a run there just earlier this year. This is it. Doesn't look like hell, does it? Just looks like a nice valley. It's now a place families take uh, their kids for picnics on the weekend. But the interesting thing is, this is the Valley of Hinnon. In Jesus' original language, Gehenna, hell. How did this come to have this um, connection with Um, fiery judgment. The fact is, this valley south of Jerusalem was infamous centuries before Jesus as a place where ancient people sacrificed their own children to pagan gods in a fire ritual. And the Old Testament itself mentions this numerous times and promises that just as in the valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, there was a, you know, a fiery evil against children. God himself will come in his judgment and turn it into the valley of slaughter. I'm not making this up. Here is Jeremiah, five, six hundred years before Jesus, um, talking about just this. The people of Judah have done evil in my eyes, declares the Lord. They have set up their detestable idols in the house that bears my name and have defiled it. They have built the high places of Topath, in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, Ger-Hena, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire, something I did not command, nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call it Topheth, or the valley of Ben-Hinnom, Gehenna, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury the dead in Topheth. Until there is no more room. The deathly, fiery valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, became a metaphor after this passage of God's final judgment. So that by the time Jesus goes around speaking about people going to Gehenna, people weren't thinking, oh, they're going to go down to that little valley. Down the, no, they already knew for centuries this was a metonym, an image, a word picture of the final judgment of God. So people sometimes ask me, 
Are you one of those fire and brimstone Christians, John? Do you believe in hell? And I usually say something like, well, it depends. I, I, I probably don't believe in the hell you might have in your mind from a Simpsons episode. <laughs> or from a Dante poem. Where um, images have been turned into concrete descriptions. I probably don't believe in that. But you know what? I do believe in the hell that Jesus taught. That God will overthrow all that is opposed to his purposes of love and justice. It might not involve actual fire, just as it might not involve actual darkness, but it must be serious. As serious as both those images convey. God will condemn all who have opposed his purposes of love and justice. So here's a very important statement. To the degree that I have participated in hate and injustice, that is the degree to which I will face the judgment of God. And the passage Jeff read earlier brings all of this together. Where Jesus, in Matthew's gospel, gives one of his parables about his own judgment of the entire world. Here we are face to face with the historical Jesus preaching not only about judgment, but about his role in the judgment. When the Son of Man, that's Jesus' favorite description of himself, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, which turns out is not just a royal throne, but a judicial one. All nations will be gathered before him. Let's think of this. Ancient Rome, the modern Czech Republic, Chicagoland, all gathered before him. And he will separate the people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, to the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, and so on. You remember the passage as Jeff read it. But then toward the end of the parable, then he will say to those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, and so on. Again, the fire is clearly a metaphor, just as sheep and goats function here as metaphors. But they're metaphors of something real, of God's separation of people, of God's judgment upon people. But notice again, again, the reason for the judgment Injustice, coldness of heart, turning a blind eye to the needy, lack of love. However you want to put it, that's the criterion of judgment. It's really important to say, especially if you're someone who's sort of had a damaged experience with judgy Christians, that the judgment of God in the Bible is not meant to be a theological scare tactic designed to make you more religious. It is God's pledge to wounded humanity that he hears the cry for justice and he will bring his justice to bear on every evil act. God will bring justice for Tanja. But he will also bring justice for the poor we have neglected. For the genuine refugees we've shunned 
and shamed. For victims of church abuse. For those we've trodden down in business to get where we're going. Justice is coming. The degree to which I have participated in hate and injustice will be the degree to which I deserve judgment. I once asked a group of year 10 students. Um, I don't know what year 10 is here. It's not junior, it's sophomore. 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 I was speaking to some sophomores, year 10s in Australia. And I used to have the privilege of speaking in lots of schools and I had this group at least as big as this, maybe a bit bigger, and they, they were a little bit rowdy. But at one point I asked them uh, to imagine their entire life, every thought, word and deed in a film that I was about to play. And the murmurers, you know, some of them were already saying, mine would be rated R, R you know, <clears throat> 15-year-old boys. But then I said, okay, imagine everything in the film, everything you've done, said, and thought. Imagine God decided to hold the bad bits against you. Just imagine. And there was this young bloke sitting at the back who didn't realize he was sitting right near Buff, my wife, and he mouthed out loud, I'd be stuffed. Which means ruined, wrecked, destroyed. I don't know, is, is it a naughty word even here? No, it's not. Now, that's not the most theologically, you know, articulate expression, but it's instinctively right. If God held everything against me, I mean, imagine every ambitious fantasy we don't let others see, the sexual encounter, illicit, online or in reality. The lie we hope is never discovered. The sharp word we can never take back. The middle class niceness that we use to cover our deep resentments. The dollars we crave and spend with no thought for those in need. If God held us accountable for every thought, word, and deed that was contrary to love, contrary to justice, I, I ask, who of us really thinks we are on the right side of the justice equation? Who of us would dare to think we don't need that forgiveness that the Apostle Peter preached right alongside judgment, where he said he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. I love this because I am sure Peter is so confident that he must preach forgiveness right alongside judgment because he had heard Jesus do it all the time. All the time. He knew firsthand, Peter, that Jesus never preached judgment without offering anyone who wanted it mercy. In fact, I bet Peter remembered the day Jesus preached Matthew 25, that parable of the sheep and the goats, that awful picture of the division of humanity and the judgment of eternal fire and so on, because the very next line in Matthew's gospel is extraordinary. No sooner has Jesus been talking about, then they will go away to eternal punishment, than we read this, the very next line. When Jesus had finished saying all these things about the judgment, he said to his disciples, as you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man, there's that title again, will be handed over to be crucified. What I find remarkable about Matthew's 
account of this part of the story of Jesus is the opening line of it said, Jesus described himself as the son of man who will judge all the world. And now it's the son of man who's going to be crucified at the Passover. We have something very close to the heart of the Christian faith right here in this paragraph. The Passover lamb in the Jewish tradition was sacrificed as a picture of God's judgment falling on the lamb and passing over God's people. That's why it's called Passover. And now Jesus is saying, at the Passover, I am going to be crucified. Just like the Passover lamb. Jesus didn't warn of judgment without making clear his first mission was to die for us. That we might be forgiven. If I can put it like this, the key to thinking about judgment is to realize that the judge is also the savior. It really wasn't easy for Judy, whom I mentioned at the outset, to come to that realization. Um, She could not get out of her head the image of the preacher preaching hell with a smile on his face. Like he was the righteous and they were all going to hell. But she did get rid of that image. The way she did it was she read the Gospels. She looked to Jesus himself. Because in Jesus, it is crystal clear That the judgment is about justice. But even though we are on the wrong side of the justice equation, every one of us can have his mercy for which he died. And and I'm thrilled to be able to say that uh, Judy came to a deep, joyful faith, even as the cancer took her in the weeks that followed. It was one of the privileges of my early ministry to lead her funeral. So confident that she died confident in the judge who is the saviour. So much more to say on this and maybe the questions you have will give me opportunity to say uh, some more more things. But thank you so much for listening uh, to this otherwise depressing topic. So I think we, um, we have a couple of mics. Um, microphone. Yeah, we have some microphones, and uh, feel free to ask them in the room right here in front. Andrew, right? We passed by right there. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Thank you again, Doctor, for your candid talk. Um, I'm kind of emotional about this because uh, the church has been abusive in many, many areas. And in today's culture, they're bringing in much of the cultural norms right into the church in order to rectify the abuses of the past. Uh, how do you, or what do you say to a church that is trying to be relevant to today's culture and literally pendulum swinging to the other direction where the abuse is pretty evident? Yeah, I mean, it's um, a perennial problem, right? Um, Fallen human beings like us uh, can take some of the things Jesus said and did, and we can use them for our own power. And and this can lead to some very abusive behavior, and it's it's happened. We can't deny it. Yeah. And then so often what happens um, is is that in reaction to that, uh, the the church might overreact. And and so you might get a, a church that was all judgy, you know, and it was just sort of, depressing to be, you know, near any of them um, and, and, and kind of manipulative, right? And then people rebel against that and suddenly they're preaching a Christianity in which Jesus was never a judge, right? Um, 
that might be a sort of a happier, more psychologically uh, um, pleasant experience, but, but it's equally wrong. Um, what I was trying to do is, is draw us back, um, not to the pendulum swing out there, that, that poor Judy suffered for nearly 40 years walking out of the church because of that. But I don't, I don't want to swing that way. I mean, the whole idea of a pendulum is the best spot is in the middle. <laughs> and Jesus, uh, the judge who is the savior, I think is the middle. And um, the, the way to escape either extreme is to read the gospels. Because that's the real deal, you know? The, the church might have invented all sorts of things, um, but the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and John is free giveaway uh, tonight if you've not, never read it, um, they are the real deal. They are the original, and therefore they are the balance. They are the perfect point. And so what the church always needs to do is to come back to Jesus in the Gospels. That's the safe space. It doesn't get rid of judgment, but it holds judgment in tension with his love and his coming as our saviour. And this, you might not be able to read it, but this is why I wore tonight's T-shirt. Um, it says, loved. Yeah? Loved. Justice is real, yes, judgment is coming, but we also loved. Yeah. Um, I'll spit out the question first and then give you a little example of experience I had many years ago. Uh, I'd like you to comment on the eternal aspect of hell versus heaven. And my frame of reference was, I was at Stanford University in California at a place that had a Rodin Museum display and had a, an earthquake. The building with all of his artifacts was unsafe to go in. But at the front of it, was something by Rodin called the Gates of Hell. And it was a metal casting, I mean huge, and captured on it were all these figures in torment. And the message apparently, and I'm not an art major, was that these figures are cast in the metal eternally in torment. So could you comment on that? Well, there's no avoiding that Jesus himself constantly used the word eternal uh, when he spoke of judgment. I mean, and he would often pair the entry into the kingdom of God was eternal, life is eternal, and judgment is eternal. Um, so I know there are people uh, who, you know, um, eminent people who have tried to say that while eternal life is eternal, eternal judgment is temporal. Yeah, and I don't see a way of making uh, Jesus say that. So my feeling is, uh, I think Jesus is probably right on all these things. And um, <laughs> my favorite ideas uh, are probably not. Um, so I, yeah, so I, I am a believer that in eternal judgment, that hell um, is eternal. I, I'm clear that, um, these are metaphors, that, like hell itself is a metaphor, um, uh, darkness is a metaphor, fire is a metaphor. So I, I want to be sensitive to the way Jesus himself presents it. He's the one who makes it clear that it's a metaphor, but it's a metaphor of something real, and he keeps on calling it eternal. So I'm going to stick with that. Yeah. One question that came in via text is, why wouldn't God just get rid of all the evil to begin with? Uh, if he knew this is the way it would go, why did he allow it to continue? Um, why not just stop it to begin with and therefore get rid of hell altogether? Well, in a way, we, we talked about this last week, so um, I, don't, I, I don't know that I can uh, re-offer the answer I gave last week, but maybe go and check the video out, because this is the problem of evil and, and suffering, and why did, why did God let it unfold uh, this way? Um, but I will say... Um, th then you wouldn't all be here experiencing life and knowing love um, and having the opportunity of eternal joy. If God had just, you know, I don't know, let's just go back to the flood. If God had said, right, that's it, you know, I don't even like Noah, right? 
just gone. Um, I guess I would say uh, the consequences of that were worse than the consequences of God's unfolding universe in which we are experiencing life. But I preferred my answer last week. Um, this is something I've been thinking about and struggling with. I have no idea where that voice is coming from. Oh, hello. Your first oh, lecture. <laughs> it's very disconcerting. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, um, I believe that I have a right to my life, and if I were seriously attacked where my life was at risk, I would fight. And how can I balance that against turn the other cheek? Okay. Um, turn the other cheek is a reference to um, an ancient insult. If someone slaps you on one cheek, the slap was not a, um, someone mugging you in the street. The slap was an actual grown-up's insult. I know it sounds like no one would do it now, although they do at the Academy Awards every now and then. <laughs> there, was, there was one just last year, wasn't there? Um, but see, you know, that, <laughs> like actually what happened there, were, like, that was more insult and outrage than, a, than an actual fight. Um, and, and in antiquity, it was more like that. And so it isn't, it isn't Jesus saying, you know, just be a, be a mouse and let everyone just ride over you. Um, he's saying bear insult for Christ without returning in kind. Um, and the way Peter would put the same idea um, in his letter is, um, do not return insult for insult, but return with blessing. I think that's the same, the same concept. Yeah, uh, I am of the view, just to be clear, that um, self-defense is permissible in, in Christian theology, just as um, defense of nation against evil uh, and invaders is um, biblically um, accepted and sound. Yeah. yeah. Um. So you talked a bit earlier about um, the guy who said he was stuck when you know, we were all yeah. considering all the stuff that we've said, thought, done. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a way that we could be in receiving of judgment in terms of being in hell but also heaven at the same time? Because there are people that do a lot of bad and a lot of good, and it's hard to really balance the two things with each other. So if you're doing a lot of both, which... Where does that end up placing you? Thank you. Um, again, I go back to Jesus who taught uh, that there is a great chasm between those who are under judgment uh, and those uh, who, who enjoy God's kingdom. And the important thing Jesus said was, although judgment is according to your works in proportion to your deeds, salvation isn't. Salvation you know, the people who experience salvation don't experience salvation because they did, you know, two-fifths of good works, right? So they experienced two-fifths of heaven or God's kingdom. That's, that's not what Jesus taught. Jesus, Jesus taught that we are all fallen short, we have all fallen short, um, and, that, and that the judgment will be in accordance with how we have behaved. The, the judgment is according to justice. The salvation in heaven is not according to justice. It's, it, it's, it's according to the overwhelming love and mercy of God that wipes away all my wrongdoing. So that um, I, though a deeply fallen human being, who, who, who might only have one-fifth of my works that are pretty good, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to heaven because of that. I, I'm, I'm there because Christ's death on the cross has wiped away all my sins. All my sins. So putting those two thoughts together, there is a great separation between the judgment and life. And judgment is according to works, but life is not according to works. It's according to God's grace and love. I think holding those two thoughts together is the answer to your question. Yeah. John, here's one from a texter. Um, how can a layman or an average person effectively determine when reading the Gospels uh, and the rest of the Bible, for that matter, which parts are metaphorical and which are literal, without a PhD in ancient history? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> um, pretty easy. Because, I mean, when Jesus says uh, 
that the nations are going to be sheep and goats and separate them, you instantly know, you, you don't need a PhD in ancient history to go, that, that sounds like a metaphor, right? Sheep and goats, yeah. And so when you've got fire on, on the lips of Jesus in one passage about hell and darkness in another passage, you just use your normal comprehension reading ability um, to know that fire and darkness can't coexist. They're like fire ruins darkness all the time, every time. But Jesus, why is Jesus so comfortable saying that, that hell is like darkness and hell is like fire, even though they're contradictory? It's because he's clearly happy to use images, metaphors. Um, the, the, the key is not to get a PhD in ancient history. The key is to read the Gospels over and over and over, and you get a sense of the, the voice of Jesus, the way he speaks, and you will clearly get a sense that he's very happy with metaphor and image and symbol. And then other times it's really clear that he means it in a concrete way. Yeah, so I'd hate to give the impression that you've got to be super learned to know this. You do, you do just have to read him a lot, read Jesus a lot, and you'll be fine. Yeah, okay, there it is. Yeah, my name's Larry. Um, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to be saved, and I know that. So my feeling on judgment is you're in, okay? But for Christians who are saved, I kind of think the judgment may be your opinion on this. Um, for someone who their whole life is bad, and on their deathbed they believe in Jesus versus a Mother Teresa their whole life, I think my judge, our judgments would be more like, Am I going to have a mansion in heaven or am mm. I just going to squeak in and get heaven by the skin of my teeth or what are my jewels in heaven? Mm. You know, mm. that concept mm. as far as us who are believers, we're going to be in heaven, but yeah. what's our gifts or rewards? Two things to say about this. Uh, happily, Jesus addressed this very question. Um, <clears throat> there's a teaching where he, um, it's a parable, and he said, um, uh, a wealthy man came to some workers early in the morning and said, um, do you want to work for me today in the field? Uh, would a denarius be okay? A denarius is a full day's wages. And they all said, fantastic, brilliant. And then Jesus says, at midday, the, the, the wealthy person went down and found some other people just lying around. And, and he said, do you want to work? They said, we'd love to work. Well, do you want to come work for me? Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll come work for you. That's fantastic. And they are offered a denarius as well. And then an hour before knockoff time, right, um, he finds another group and says, come on, you want to do some work? Yeah, we want to do some work. And at, at knock-off time, that's an expression, Jeff, knock-off time. You knock off work. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> it is now. Okay. <laughs> like brekkie. Okay. The hour at which you finish work. Um, the, the, the rich person gives the people at the beginning a denarius, just like he promised. People at midday are denarius. People with one hour's work are denarius. The people who were there all day complained. Why are they getting the same as we're getting? And the, um, the, the rich person in Jesus' parable says, <clears throat> are you annoyed that I'm generous? Did, didn't, you, didn't we agree that you would get this? And Are you annoyed that I'm generous to them? And of course, the point that Jesus is making is whether long time or short time in the faith, the kingdom of God is the same. Joy and salvation is the same. Because it comes from the generosity of God, not from the good works of human beings. But I did say there were two things to say. <clears throat> so that's one thing. The second is, um, there are passages uh, that speak about... Uh, People in God's kingdom receiving uh, rewards. But the, the key phrase that's used is Stephanos, crown. And this crown is not a crown made of gold or silver. This, the Stephanos, is a, um, is, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like a, a wreath made out of plants, right? Um, and it's, it's worthless, completely worthless. It's, it's the crown that you got if you won the Olympic Games. You didn't get money. You got this worthless crown. But it was honor. 
It was honor. And I think this is the key for understanding heavenly rewards, although I don't even like that expression. That God will honor those who have done spectacular work for him. And we will all cheer. This really came home to me years ago when a um, wonderful woman in our church who'd been in our church, I don't know, 60 years and on staff of 50, like crazy, Jean Rickson. And she just went around visiting people tirelessly right till she was about 80. And she suddenly died. And, you know, it was, it was really troubling. But at her funeral, just to hear about her little acts of service over such a long time, I thought, I thought to myself, on in God's kingdom, people aren't going to be going, oh, John Dixon, you wrote a book. <laughs> right? But they will be going, Gene Rickson, no one saw what you did tirelessly for decades, humbly serving. And, and the Lord is going to say, well done, good and faithful Gene Rickson. And we will all stand in you know, and applaud. That to me is the Stephanos, the, the honour that, that seems right. It's not a reward as in I get a bigger mansion or she gets a bigger mansion than I do. It's, it's the honour that you receive from the Almighty who acknowledges your humility and love for him. Yeah. Hello. Um, I just want to make a comment that um, I hate to look at this as a, as a engineer, but Matthew 25 <laughs> says it's a digital experience. You're either white or you're black. You know, you're either a goat or you're a sheep. But then uh, the more you talk and talk about this chasm is, is God's judgment is even more confusing because there are no white sheep and there are no black goats or dirty goats. So. He, he has this amazing, amazing way to look at each and every one of us and, and evaluate that in a very fair way. And yeah. that's the way I see it. Okay, I like it. And, yeah. and, and the other thing is, is just that I'd like to make a distinction between judging someone and discerning something. Yep, sure. Because if somebody's beating up my children, I'm going to discern real quick that they're bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to do something about it. But am I going to judge them from... I, I can't judge them. Mm -hmm. The only person who can judge them is Jesus because he sees their heart. So I just thought I'd bring out those two things. Yes. Um, there is a bit of confusion in our wider society. When, when Christians say in public, say something is wrong. We think this is wrong, particularly on a controversial topic. Um, what people hear, sadly, is we hate your guts, right? And we are against you and we hope you go to hell. So there's a distinction between a Christian can discern something to be wrong and even say that it is without the least bit uh, trying to imply that you're a worthless human being. But sadly, that's how it's heard. The Christian needs to be able to make the distinction between judging in the sense of discernment and not judging in the sense of condemning. Does that make sense? So I'm agreeing with you. The other, the other comment I like, um, God is able to take all the messiness of all of our different kinds of behavior and, and act fairly. But I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that those who enter into God's kingdom enter there free not because of deeds. No one deserves to enter into the kingdom because of deeds. If it were only up to deeds, we are going to be condemned. But the, the white sheep aren't white because of their goodness. They're white because of Christ's grace toward them. Yeah. John, here's yeah. one from our texter. Um, could you comment on the role of, of Christians as judges? Or The New Testament indicates that we're going to reign with Christ and that we have some role in judging as well, judging the earth. If we're called to teach and to mend, are we also called to judge? Well, in the sense of discerning, but not in the sense of um, 
sending people to um, jail and dishing out fines and, and stuff like that, which the church had a good go at in the medieval period, mind you, and they got over that. But in, in, in life, no, we are, we are not to judge in that condemning sense, even though we all judge all the time in the, um, in the discerning sense. I mean, you know, the reason I use the example of Tanja and human trafficking is because everyone in the building instantly has no problem judging the human trafficker in the sense of discerning them to be on the wrong side of the justice equation. But that doesn't mean I get to condemn that person to hell. I don't want to delight in their going to hell. I, I, want, to, I, want, to, I want to point out they're wrong and, and, and try and persuade them to the good and to receive the mercy of Christ. The passage is about um, God's people judging in the kingdom. It is, is difficult. They're, they're clearly, um, there clearly is some role. I mean, Jesus mentions it. And, and the Apostle Paul mentions it, that there will be a sense in which um, God's people who have been saved because of Christ's mercy will be on the, the side of the judge, looking on at the judgment. And in that sense, we are with the judge, judging wickedness. But we don't get to do any of the judging. It's all him. Yeah. Hello, I have a question. Hello. Can you comment about people not being saved and Jesus the judge sending them to eternal hell? Um, isn't, isn't that what my whole talk was about? I sort well, of feel like... Well, I guess basically, um, so if you're not saved, are, yeah. you going to, are you going to hell? What I'm, what I'm saying is that that's a, um, a neat way of saying it in a sentence that can very easily be misunderstood. And so I'd rather spend the 35 minutes that, that I spent trying to unpack this um, and, and make the point that it is, it is because of justice, that God's love of love and love of justice, that, um, that we'll be judged. We're not going to be judged for having not heard about Jesus. That, that isn't one of the criterion, right? That's not the criterion. No one's being judged for not having heard. That would be unfair. But we are all to be judged on the basis of how we acted in love and justice. And we all fall short. The scripture is absolutely clear about that. And there is one way to escape judgment free of charge. And that is because Christ died for us, so that all of the injustice and hate that I have participated in, all of the judgment that I deserve for my participation in hate and injustice, has fallen on Jesus, the Passover lamb. So that to the degree that I cling to Jesus, no, I don't even want to say to the degree, the fact that I cling to Jesus as my only hope is my guarantee that I am forgiven and I will face the judgment incredibly thankful for all that I have escaped because of Jesus. But if someone hasn't called upon Jesus for the forgiveness he freely offers, then they will face the judgment according to their works. And I would um, beg you not to take that risk. Don't face a judgment on your works and miss out on life when there is free forgiveness available because of Jesus. Does that come close to the kind of comment you wanted me to make or answer to your question? It does, thanks. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yes, I would like to make a, an observation um, <clears throat> that I think is helpful, was very helpful for myself. I recall a group of men meeting, a uh, Bible study meeting, and the subject of justice and being judged came up, and uh, <clears throat> many of them were fearful of that. Uh, they just, you know, the idea of standing before Jesus judged, it, it, it gave them terror. 
even though they were devout Christians and had been essentially all their lives, until I was able to share with them this concept, which I would like to see if you can even make it better, uh, is that we should, as believers, not think of judgment as anything but freedom. There is, when I think of judgment, I think of freedom. Christ has paid it all. There's nothing to fear. Mm. I am totally and free in Christ, and there is nothing greater than that. Mm. So I don't know if you have a comment. Yes, um, for the believer, the judgment of God will just remind them of the love that allowed their escape, yeah. if I can put it like that. Because we, we will be, we who are in Christ will be equally deserving of judgment, but we'll have escaped. So in that sense, yes, judgment is a reminder of our freedom, you put it. I would say of how much we are loved. And then there are those who just take the risk. I'll stand before God and I'll let him judge me according to my works. I'm going to take that risk. Not me. I'm not doing that. Uh, Dr. Dixon, we're in the midst of a migrant crisis in the United States and around the world. My question is, what mindset of his children would be pleasing to Jesus? S sorry, w what's the question? What? I, I didn't understand. What mindset of his children would be pleasing to Jesus? Oh, what, what should be our mindset at yeah. those? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, I'm a foreigner and you let me in, and I'm very grateful for it, so I don't, want to, um, I, don't, I don't want to say anything inappropriate. I mean, when I mentioned refugees in, in my talk, I said God will judge us for every genuine refugee we shunned. And I was very clear that I meant genuine refugee, because I don't think everyone has a right to enter a country just because they want to. Just as People don't have a right to enter through your gate and in your front door and, and take a room in your house. If, if you believe in personal property law, you must believe in national property law. Um, however, um, Jesus did say that someone who was uh, begging um, outside someone's house uh, and the rich man... Um, had to walk over the poor man, Lazarus, every day, and he did nothing for him. Um, Jesus said, the rich man went to hell. So I'm reminded that although it's true that you must protect your nation, just as you must protect your house, a nation that is not extraordinarily generous, just as a human who is not extraordinarily generous with all that God has given you, the greatest nation on earth... I mean that in all sincerity. Um, God will judge where we haven't been, you haven't been, we haven't been, extraordinarily generous to genuine asylum seekers and refugees. I don't know how we hold those things in balance, but I, I know that God wants massive compassion in our hearts. If, our, if I can put it like this, if our first thought is border security, that's sub-Christian. Our, our first thought should be that gut-wrenching sorrow for the needy, even if there may be a decision that we can't accept everyone and that we have to... Um, I was going to say build a wall, but... Um, I, don't <laughs> um, I should probably stop while I'm ahead. <clears throat> You've done well this far. Um, who else has a, a really tough political question for John? <laughs> okay, what do we do with the passage in Revelation 21 that talks about um, in, when God and Jesus are judging? He says the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, and so forth, all liars, which all of us are liars, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. 
Is that metaphor, are you saying again? Oh, yeah. Because all of us yeah. are, frankly, all these things we have been, or some of us, and the Bible says even covetousness mm. is worthy of damnation in the hell. Oh, and, of yeah. course, Christ has forgiven us. Yeah. And I think heaven, and like you say, the works and the, um, the rewards will be how much we have shown love for Christ, mm. whether, you know, whatever area. And that's really what's going to be rewarded. How much have we loved him? by how much have we loved others. But so are you saying this in Revelation 21 is also not literal fire and burning damnation? Yes, definitely I'm saying that. Um, it, it's definitely a metaphor. I mean, Revelation especially, it uses images that are well known in Jewish literature of, of all sorts of things. I mean, for goodness sake, a couple of chapters earlier, Jesus comes back riding a white horse. <laughs> and, and there's a sword that comes out of his mouth. I do not believe... Jesus is returning on a white horse. But this is a picture of victory. And the sword coming out of his mouth is clearly a, a symbol of his very word is the sword of the Spirit. But the judgment is real. So what, I'm making a distinction between metaphors used to bolster truths. So the truth in the passage you just said is that those who have vilely disobeyed God and ruined people's lives will be condemned unless they have sincerely drawn on Christ's mercy they'll they will escape they will enjoy the kingdom forever but the the images of a fire of lake and Jesus riding a horse and beasts coming out of the ocean these are all picture these are all picture language but picture language of real things please don't please don't hear me saying picture language means it's not real picture language just means that it's it's that scripture uses imaginative images to um, arouse our imaginations to take something seriously. Hell is like a lake of fire. It is bad. It is inescapable. That, that's the point that's made there. But the, at the center of the book of Revelation, and maybe here is where I end, at the center of the book of Revelation is the theme that people look up into heaven and the glory of God is revealed. And what do they see? It says, a lamb who looks as though it had been slain. That is the very center of the book of Revelation. The picture we're to take is not a lake of fire and so on, but a lamb who had been slain. And yes, that is picture language too. But of what? Amidst the promise and threat of genuine judgment, there is the possibility of salvation because Jesus is the Passover lamb who was sacrificed for our sins that we might be freely forgiven. That's a perfect place to end. John, do you want to give us a little teaser about what's to come next week as we wrap up this, this wonderful series? One of the uh, most interesting and discussed topics in the very nerdy scholarship about the historical Jesus is his radical whining and dining with sinners. And there's tons of volumes written on this because it's extraordinary. We know of no other teacher like it in antiquity. And so people have been trying to understand why did he invite himself to the homes of sinners, breaking all sorts of religious rules that I'll, I'll talk you through next week. You can see the rules that he broke deliberately to invite people to his table of friendship. So I'm going to be talking about Jesus as friend of sinners. Or... Jesus, the rule breaker. Why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, let's pray. And let's say thanks to John once again. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I want to encourage you, uh, next week we wrap up the series. All of these will be available online to share with friends who maybe have questions or to revisit yourself for continued learning. Uh, invite somebody that you've been thinking about and praying for to engage in this conversation as we finish up next, next Saturday night. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your grace. These topics are difficult for us, make us tremble a bit and um, turn our minds inside out. But thank you for John's reminder, your reminder through John, that at the center of it all is you, Jesus. 
offering salvation and love, that we can indeed be loved and forgiven. And we pray this in your name. Amen.